Uh, the question I would like to address today is uh, whether the psychology of creativity offers uh, circumstantial evidence in favor of Edward de Vere as the author of the Shakespeare corpus. Otherwise put, is our current understanding of imminent creativity consistent with de Vere's life and character? I'm going to touch on these three topics, convergent versus divergent thinking, the 10-year rule of dedicated preparation, and personality traits of creative individuals. I'll also comment on the relationship of each of these topics to relevant items in De Vere's biography. Starting with uh, convergent versus divergent thinking. Convergent thinking is the process by which we retrieve information from long-term memory to provide correct answers to factual questions. For example, what is the distance between New York and London? What is the name of the country formerly known as East Pakistan? This information is acquired both through personal experience and via the more formal modes of didactic education. Individual differences, uh, individual differences in convergent thinking ability can be re uh, reliably measured with IQ tests, which are mostly about getting the right answers to specific questions. Now, for many years, psychologists thought that creative accomplishment could be attributed to unusually high intelligence that is high convergent thinking ability. But the situation is more complicated. We now understand that highly creative people typically have high IQs, but having a high IQ does not fully explain their creativity. For example, the average IQ among scientists is above 98% of the general population. However, if we compare more creative to less creative scientists, we don't find any differences in IQ between those two groups. Okay, I better <laughs> summarize that. In brief, imminent crea imminently creative people tend to be highly intelligent, but only a subset of highly intelligent people are eminently creative. Creative accomplishment requires a competence in addition to intelligence that is divergent thinking. This is a process of generating novel solutions to problems lacking answers. For example, how can we design an aircraft to fly from New York to London in 30 minutes? How can we write an engaging musical about Alexander Hamilton, of all people? <laughs> Questions like these require associating ideas and images in novel ways that provide a useful solution to the problem. As, as expressed by the mathematician uh, Poincaré a century ago, to create consists of making new combinations of associated elements which are, which are useful. Uh, that is uh, uh, the most co concise and precise definition of creativity that I've ever come across. And he rightfully makes the uh, the central notions, new combinations, not novelty, and usefulness. I can illustrate the generation of novel answers by reference to a hypothetical word association test in which two subjects are asked to respond to the word foot with as many related words as come to mind. 
The first subject gives us four associations. Shoe, toe, leg, walk, and then stops as if he's out of gas, out of ideas. The associations are called strong in the sense of being highly probable, but they are also conventional and, and not very interesting. The first thing uh, you notice in this subject's uh, uh, associations is that the person has a much greater fluency than the first subject. Fluency does not guarantee that associations will be uh, novel or fruitful. However, as Linus Pauling said when asked how he was able to win two Nobel Prizes, quote, it's easy. You think of a lot of ideas and you throw away the bad ones. So you're allowed to be really quite fluent, just get rid of the bad stuff. Uh, this subject starts with three strong high probability associations, but then continues with a long series of responses they become increasingly divergent. That is, they become weaker and more remotely related to the stimulus word. As the associations uh, become weaker, they become increasingly novel and unconventional. So uh, this subject starts with uh, a number of strong associations, toe leg walk like the other fellow, and then moves to bath, massage, Ball, which is pretty interesting, as in football. He then moves on to a series of uh, associations of moderate strength. And I, I have to interject here. He or she moves on. Uh, soldier, pedal, print, bridge, inch, as in 12 inches in a foot. Stirrup is an interesting association. And then a series of, uh, weak, uh, of uh, weak associations. Bed, as in foot of the bed. Fall, footfall. Mouth, foot in mouth. Loose, loose foot. Bill, foot the bill. Ledge, foot on a ledge. And big, big foot. In sum, divergent thinking is a process by which we combine low probability or weak associations into novel ideas or images. If the novel combination is also useful in solving some problem, we call it creative. How does all this relate to De Vere? Well, was he a skilled convergent thinker? That is, was he intelligent, learned, witty, articulate? Of course he was, we all know that. And I don't need to cite uh, chapter and verse for this audience about his convergent thinking ability. Was he also a skilled divergent thinker? Well, it's too late to give him a creativity test, but his acknowledged contributions as a poet and playwright are the sort of accomplishments that creativity tests were designed to predict. We don't need any more confirmation of his divergent thinking ability. <clears throat> In sum, De Vere clearly exemplified the high levels of both convergent and divergent thinking associated with imminent creativity. the 10-year rule of dedicated preparation. <clears throat> There's an old joke about a guy trying to find Carnegie Hall to attend a concert, but he's hopelessly lost. Fortunately, he sees a person coming toward him carrying a violin case. Tell me if you know this one. Yes. <laughs> he goes up to this apparent musician and says, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to Carnegie Hall? 
The musician replies, practice, practice, practice. The joke is consistent with the 10-year rule, which holds that a long period of intense preparation in one's field of endeavor is a necessary prerequisite to creative accomplishment. Many of those we have dubbed geniuses have said as much. This is Mozart writing to his father. People make a great mistake who think that my art has come easily to me. Nobody has devoted so much time and thought to compositions as I. Mozart began his study of music under his father's tutelage at about the age of five. His first seven piano concertos, written between the ages of 11 to 16, were primarily modifications or arrangements of the works of other composers. Music critics consider his piano concerto number nine, written at age 21 after 15 years of study, to be his first masterpiece. Uh, this is uh, Michelangelo responding to the acclaim for his Pieta. If people knew how hard I had to work to gain my mastery, it would not seem so wonderful at all. Michelangelo was apprenticed to a, a painter at age 13 and then studied sculpture under the patronage of Lorenzo de' Medici. While still a teenager, he produced a number of promising sculptures on commission. But it was not until the age of 24, fully 10 years after beginning his apprenticeship, that he produced his uh, Pieta of Mary and the Crucified Jesus, which was immediately regarded as a masterpiece. Thus, Mozart and Michelangelo seem to be asking us not to invoke some vague, unspecified, innate talent to explain their creative accomplishments. Rather, they want us to know that they work very hard for many long years to achieve their, their success. <clears throat> These and similar anecdotes have been uh, more recently uh, led to a great deal of research on the 10-year rule, which holds that imminent creativity requires approximately a decade of prior immersion in one's area of endeavor. This notion was first developed by Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S, in the 1980s. Hayes examined the biographies of large numbers of eminently creative painters, composers, and poets to determine the amount of time between the beginning of their careers and the production of their first masterpiece. He found that these artists required more or less 10 years of sustained engagement in their field before creating their acclaimed work. Similar studies have found the same effect in a variety of groups, including eminent sculptors, mathematicians, scientists, and chess players, among others. Uh, two points to emphasize. The subjects of Hayes' research were not creative people in general. We're talking here only about those individuals whom we dub geniuses because of the impact of their contributions. The data show that even members of this rarefied group required years of dedicated preparation to develop the skills underlying their mature work. Second, we should not take the 10-year rule too literally. This is not rocket science. There will be variation in the amount of time required in different domains of endeavor and variations among individuals in specific domains. 10 is simply a round number that reminds us that many years of preparation set the basis for subsequent 
creative eminence. See, I only have one hand available. Was, uh, what about Edward de Vere? Was his writing career consistent with the 10-year rule? Well, let's take the year 1576 as a beginning point. That's the year he returned uh, from Italy and began to devise interludes and comedies for a court audience. If we jump ahead 10 years to 1586, what do we find? Well, we find William Webb in his uh, Discourse of English Poetry extolling De Vere's skills in what he called the devices of poetry. This sentiment is repeated three years later by the, uh, the anonymous author of The Art of Poetry, who in addition explicitly praised De Vere's interludes and comedies. In brief, then, knowledgeable commentators were beginning to take notice some 10 or, four, uh, 10 or more years following De Vere's first theatrical productions. Unfortunately, now, we do not know which of those productions the commentators had in mind, and so do not know if they really achieved the extraordinary quality of the later Shakespeare canon. Nevertheless, I would argue that De Vere's progress as a dramatist appears to be consistent with the dedicated preparation required by the 10-year rule. There's a large uh, literature on the uh, personality traits of highly creative individuals and I will focus on three of the most uh, prominent. Openness to experience. The highly creative typically display a deep interest in a variety of undertakings and questions outside of their central domain of accomplishment. Such polymaths are said, uh, maths are said to be open to experience, a disposition to seek novelty, and complexity, and to find associations between apparently disparate domains of endeavor. In addition to wide interests, open uh, individuals are intellectually, intellectually curious, t uh, lead active fantasy lives, and are drawn to poetry, music, and art. By contrast, individuals low on openness are described as practical, down-to-earth, traditional, and affectively restrained. Autonomy and independence, it really has a, a couple of aspects to it. The first is the preference for solitary work. Creative accomplishment requires profound concentration and long areas of deep engagement with the problem at hand. This requires privacy, freedom from distraction, and separation from the demands of other, of other people. Autonomy and independence is also associated with a high degree of self-confidence and an almost missionary zeal to prevail in one's creative endeavors. Paul Gauguin asserted that he was the future of modern art. Frank Lloyd Wright pronounced himself the, word, the world's greatest living architect. Wright added that he preferred, preferred honest arrogance to hypocritical humility. Uh, unconventionality, uh, creative uh, artists as opposed to scientists uh, particularly tend not to be dutiful, reliable, orderly, or cooperative. Rather, they tend to be skeptical, unpredictable, disorganized, and sometimes disreputable. They are impatient with conventional wisdom and reject social constraints on their freedom of action. 
a no trespassing sign is an invitation to trespass. I can make what I've just said uh, more explicit by showing you the combined results of three separate studies contrasting more creative to less creative writers, mathematicians, and architects. In each study, the subjects underwent a lengthy assessment over several days, at the end of which they were rated on a list of 100 personality characteristics, of which about 10 differentiated the two groups. Excuse me, differentiated the more from the less creative members in, in, in each of those groups. And I've arranged these characteristics under openness, autonomy, unconventionality. Okay, are you with me? These are items that distinguish between uh, more and less creative writers, mathematicians, and architects combined. Under openness, I have has a high range of, or, of interests, genuinely values intellectual and cognitive matters, thinks and associates to ideas in unusual ways, has unconventional thought processes, is intuitive. How do we relate, the, how do these relate to Devere? Starting with the first uh, bullet point, Devere certainly had a wide range of interests, didn't he? By my count, he was an athlete, dancer, musician, poet, playwright, polyglot, foreign traveler, Siegmund soldier, lawyer, courtier, Bohemian. Point two about intellectual and cognitive matters can be considered a personality analog of high convergent thinking ability, which we've already discussed. Likewise, point three is a personality analog of high divergent thinking ability, also discussed. Edward de Vere was clearly open to experience. Values own independence and autonomy, is resolute, often has a sense of destiny about oneself as a human being, has a high aspiration level for self, is certain of the worth and validity of one's creative efforts. This, for me at least, is a little more difficult to relate to De Vere. For example, um, bullet point number one, a preference for autonomy would appear to characterize the last dozen or so years of De Vere's life during his so-called reclusive period. On the other hand, during his bohemian period in the 1580s, he worked with other writers and apparently enjoyed their company. Points two and three, I would imagine that De Vere had a sense of destiny and self-worth, but I've yet to find good document, uh, documentary evidence of this. Points two and three are certainly a theme in the sonnets. Sense of destiny about oneself, the long-term validity of one's creative efforts, etc. But I have tried to avoid begging the authorship question by citing the Shakespeare canon. So I, I uh, for one, have to leave this trait as an open question for now. I'm glad to have any uh, suggestions that might help me resolve my ambiguity here. Unconventionality tends to be rebellious and non-conforming, is critical, skeptical, not easily impressed, does not judge self and others in conventional terms like popularity, the correct thing to do. To say that De Vere was unconventional is an understatement. I think we all know that. He was perfectly capable, for example, of sassing the queen, of ignoring her requests, and of carrying on an, an illicit 
affair with one of her ladies in waiting. One could go on and on. Here is the way Mark Anderson put it. Quote, a year in Italy had transformed De Vere, 26-year-old chronic pain in the ass, into a chronic pain in the ass with an astonishing capacity for court comedy. I think we can all agree that De Vere was unconventional. I'm going to stop here and open the floor to discussion, but I do have one final comment. The life and character of Edward De Vere strongly exemplify the qualities psychologists associate with eminent creativity. Thank you.